an urban crime drama nicely directed by and starring Doug Williamson. One of the few black actors able to make his own movies these days. I got three rules. One, you can't kill me. Two, I gotta win all the fights. Three, I want the girl at the end of the movie. There's only been one movie that kind of dealt with the subject that I'm dealing with, and that was a black exploitation movie starring Fred Williamson. He is just ama he's an amazing actor. He's an amazing human being. When you get back to Boston, you be sure and tell my people that you just met two niggas who don't know how to sing or dance. In 1974, actor, filmmaker, and former elite athlete Fred the Hammer Williamson published a full-page advertisement in Variety magazine. It's a photo of him looking smooth as hell, and below it says, Fred Williamson is not a black actor. Fred Williamson is an actor. Fred, the ever outspoken voice of the people, published this as a rebellious retort against the American film industry. I don't know about you guys, but me, Actor, writer, director, producer, stuntman, political activist, production company CEO. As an artist, he created his own entertainment industry, free of the prejudices he found all over Hollywood and also America at large. Oh yeah, did I also forget to mention that he's one of the most recognized athletes of the 20th century? Because yeah, like that too. Those many hyphens, as impressive as that list is, paint only a narrow picture of this revolutionary artist. A man so determined to make a difference that he quit football at the height of his professional career and fame. He found being a football player wasn't very mentally challenging, and he knew that he had far more to offer the world with his mind. You see on the side, Fred was an extremely successful architect but this was never his dream either you see Fred he wasn't even really willing to admit it to himself that his whole life deep down he wanted to be a film star but not just a film star a black film star that wasn't shown as weak or downtrodden not some busboy or a housekeeper but the hero the main character the one that gets the girl at the end from the same cloth as John Wayne Lynn Eastwood black people were not weak and deep down he was sick to death to seeing it everywhere all around him in the movies the media and the world at large of course at this point there were very nuanced and highly regarded black film actors such as Sidney Poitier they Call me Mr. Tibbs. And Fred respected him like hell for his nuanced, highly intelligent, very wise black characters. But there was a part of all his characters that Fred found very underwhelming. They were not the badass black heroes he thought the world needed. In the early 70s and in the late 60s, they were still sticking dogs on black people. More than 10 blacks on a corner constituted a riot. So it was time to call out the dog squad. So there was no way for the black public to fight back. They had no way to fight back without getting themselves into serious trouble. So what we brought to them at that time was a guy who won the fight. When the smoke cleared, we were still standing. Fred always felt that the black community and especially black children needed heroes. And not always the get whitey retribution sense either. We want to stand up just as winners and as fighters. And because now I take down anybody. Now I beat up white people, yellow people, pink people, black people, purple people, no matter what color they are. If you bad and you're in my movie, you're going down. I'm gonna be the only one standing. I'm gonna be the last one to go down in my movie as this Stallone, as like Schwarzenegger, all of them. One day, Fred decided to make his dream a reality. He was watching a show called Julia after work. The main character is a black woman, and he realized that every single one of her boyfriends was less handsome than he was. <laughs> Fred's a confident motherfucker. And I mean, fair enough, look at him. Sexy motherfucker too. He went to the studio the next day and said exactly this. He said he was handsome, and she deserved better, and her dating all these bums over and over again made her look a little bit like a hoe. And they hired Fred on the spot. He had no agent, no nothing. But he had that charisma and that presence, that undeniable Fred Williamson presence. Shortly after this, Fred Williamson went on to appear in many cult classic black exploitation films, such as He's Black. He's brutal. He's boss. Fred Williamson is boss nigger. Hammer. He's a black explosion. A king of crime is born. A mob boss who started in the streets. Three the hard way. Brown. Williamson. Kelly. The big three. 
together for the first time. They do it their way. Crazy Joe. The boys up in Harlem had something he needed. Lots of black uptown muscle. Hey, what's happening, my man? And he had something the brothers wanted. The legend of nigger Charlie. Somebody warned the West. Nigger Charlie ain't running no more. Now you tell this Reverend, or whatever his name is, that if he sets one foot on this property, nigger Charlie will kill him! Kill the legend of nigger Charlie. His screen presence was, was undeniable. This man was born to be a movie star. It's clear as day. Universal Pictures felt the same, and they signed him up for a free picture contract to become the first black James Bond. It's quite a nice tan you have. <laughs> yeah, I keep it all year round, too. I mean, not officially James Bond, but that was the idea. Everything was looking up for Fred and his desire to become a black movie hero. But unfortunately, this will turn out to be one of the darkest chapters of Fred Williamson's life story. They made one film with him. Bolt. That man Bolt. The highest flying, slickest, meanest dude you'll ever face is Jefferson Bolt on the case. Fred Williamson is that man Bolt. He's bonded and it was financially successful, fun, and in fact it was profoundly successful considering its low budget. Any studio exec on earth would be happy with the financial success of this movie. But Universal called in Fred shortly afterward for a meeting. Fred thought it was a renegotiation of some kind, but they told him that they were going to renege the deal cancel it. The three movie picture deal was over. Of course this made little to no sense because the movie had made so much money, more than they even expected. It wasn't because Fred did anything, but because they did not want to be the first studio to create black movie stars. Yeah, fuck man, like imagine that. Giving your dream on a silver platter and they rip it away from you over some Jim Crow bullshit. But in retrospect, this is perhaps the best thing that could have happened to Fred and also the film industry as a whole. Because Fred the Hammer Williamson refuses to stand down, and he doesn't take disrespect lightly. Shortly after this, the film Shaft was released by MGM. If you want to see Shaft, ask your mum. And it was one of the biggest blockbusters of its time. Broke countless records and was watched by everyone of all walks of life. The evidence was in. Not only did black audiences want black films, so did everyone else too. From this success, Universal quickly realized the errors of their way. They called Fred saying that they changed their minds and they would honor the deal. Imagine you're in this situation, trying to be a star. Most probably would have accepted this deal. But this is where Fred Williamson made the first of many decisions that will make him go down in history as an icon and a revolutionary. He told them to shove it and go fuck themselves. If you don't mind, I'll move on. He started his own production company called Poor Boy Productions. This wasn't some angry bluff either. It's exactly what he did. After getting his heart broken by the studio system, and in reality America as a whole, he decided he was going to write, produce, and star in every single one of his films. He also directed most of them. In reality, this wasn't even really just a production company. Fred had created his own studio and would fund his own movies, just like George Lucas later did with Empire Strikes Back to get out of the controlling grips of the studios. But unlike George Lucas, Fred didn't exactly have millions lying around. He had thousands, which is fuck nothing when it comes to filmmaking, hence Paul Boy Productions. But what he did with that money is fucking astounding. The first film Fred produced was an improv comedy movie with the legend Richard Pryor. Atlas Films presents Fred Williamson and Richard Pryor in the year's biggest soul shootout. Adios, amigo. It's a boozing, brawling, blasting 90 minutes of non-stop excitement. Fred Williamson and Richard Pryor riding high in Adios, amigo. Coming to this theater soon. They had made the movie in seven days and the film cost $10,000 of Fred's own money. Fred wasn't too happy with the film in retrospect, but the movie made the money back damn quick. Around this time, Fred realized he needed to get away for a while. He decided to go to Europe. Later on in life, he admitted it was likely to meet different women. You from Rome? No, I'm a model. Whilst there, Fred had realized that whilst he was famous in America, 
He seemed to be a hundred times more beloved in Europe. At first this seems odd, but then if you're a history buff, what he actually experienced was very similar to what Malcolm X experienced when he visited Mecca, which was that he realized that America had become so obsessed with race. In America, I'm a black actor. In Europe, I'm an action star. It makes a whole world of difference. Being a black actor and being somebody that has respect as an action star is a whole nother ballgame. Before he started his own company, whenever he made movies, they'd always be sold to European markets for an incredibly low amount of money. However, Fred came to learn exactly why this was the case. Because the distributors over there had convinced them that blacks in films don't make money in Europe, but they were doing it only so that they could buy the film cheap and consequently net you know, money on the films when they pick them up. Fred had realized this is all a malevolent, genius scam run by the European film distributors. What's been happening is that they've been outsmarted. The producers and the buyers and the distributors in Europe have outsmarted the producers in America because now they convinced them that films with black stars don't do well in Europe. Because black movies did incredibly well in Europe. Because they weren't really seen as black movies. They were seen as action movies. This is the end of your rotten life, you motherfucking... Horror movies. <laughs> spy movies. <laughs> whatever the movie was about. Dude, that's what mm -hmm. makes it so interesting to me, to be over there and be like for your ability and your characterization and the way that you act and things that you do. Not because you're a black actor looking for some status as a star. They don't do that. They Got don't you. divide the white, the black. They don't do that. Because of these eye-opening and wonderful experiences, Fred lived in Rome for many years. Based on that understanding of how the European community felt about me, then I made an effort to, uh, to pick a city that I liked and that I think I would like, which was Rome. So I moved to Rome. I like any place that likes me. But in America, in the film industry, Fred felt that he was seen as black first and an actor second. In Europe, he did not feel this way one bit. Understanding European mentality, knowing that once you are a celebrity or a star, you are one for life. They give you your, your props and your due for life. In America, you're only as good as your last basket, your last touchdown, and your last movie. They forget about you real quick because they start looking past you for that next star that's coming up to remind them of what you used to do. Europe is not like that. Europe, they give you your prop, they give you your due. You can, you can work forever and ever because once they like you, they like you forever. Fred, now truly understanding the mindset and love from the European community, refused to sell any of his films for those measly $3,000 contracts. I had some posters made of the films that I wanted to make, and I gave the maitre d' $50 a day to save me a table on the patio outside the restaurant at the Carlton Terrace. And I sit mm -hmm. there, and I put my posters out, and they came around, and they said, Ah, Fred, you got a new movie, huh? Yeah, I got a new movie. Okay, well, I'm out for, 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 for Italy, for Spain, how much? I said, I don't know, how much you been paying? Well, we only paid $3,000 for all the films with Black Star. The last day, the last day on the terrace was me writing contracts. 25000 20000 for Mexico, 100000 for Spain, 150000 for Italy, 200000 for Great Britain. I'm, I'm cleaning up. That's how I got my movies financed. Don't forget to visit our refreshment center during the intermission or any time. Fred went on to write, direct, and star in some of the most iconic films of all time. And the fact that they were made independently, and usually with very little to almost no money, that makes it all the more astounding for me. Fred was the first black cowboy, Joshua. I'm sorry, boy. Some men rode by yesterday, took my wife, killed Martha. <laughs> You ever killed a man before? You know what it feels like to kill? I killed in the war. People I didn't even know. Only the battleground is different now. Well, technically, the first black cowboys were in the 1930s musical Harlem on the Prairie. And I have nothing but respect for these actors. But when I say cowboy, Fred wanted to be the first black cowboy superhero. A badass, tough gunslinger existing in a Leone-esque world of mythos. In the vein of those characters, he always felt needed to be seen and represented by black men. In the vein of Clint Eastwood, John Wayne, those mythic-like characters. 
He also created the first slave revenge story. I ain't never gonna be a slave again for no man. Inspiring something you may have seen a little more recently. I decided to make a Western called The Legend of Nigger Charlie. What I did was I made the film, then I took a billboard on 42nd Street in New York, 40 feet high. My shirt off, two guns on my side, and it just says, he's coming. Two weeks later, we changed the billboard. It said again, nigga Charlie is coming. The third billboard, same picture, said nigga Charlie has arrived. <laughs> What's so amazing about this, lunchtime at all the theaters on 42nd Street on Broadway was all full of whites. Suit and tie guys in their attaché cases. I had lines wrapped around the block trying to see what this movie was about. Fred, especially after leaving and coming back, had truly begun to understand the American zeitgeist and mindset when it came to race and culture. He knew exactly how to create the exact controversy the film needed to make the film a tremendous success. I did what I wanted to do was create this this interest throughout Fred's life and career I believe he achieved far more than what he set out to at the beginning back then he wanted to be a movie hero not only because he thought it would be cool but he knew that black people needed people to look up to to inspire them and to allow them to dream rather than feeling like there was no hope through his sheer grit and refusing to allow anyone to get in his way his real story is even more inspiring than that of his characters Many of his early films go by the term black exploitation. Which Fred now believes was likely in an attempt to denigrate the black filmmakers in America and kill the 70s trend. Luckily, the Hammer knew that nothing could ever silence him. Fred continues to be a beacon of hope for all people an inspiration for all artists to never say no for an answer. Before there was Django Freeman, there was Joshua. Before there was Black Panther, there was Charlie. Before there was Miles Morales, there was Black Caesar. Fred Williamson fought his whole life to give the world its first ever black superheroes. In my eyes, he is more a hero off the screen than on. Long live Fred Williamson. What's up, motherfuckers? Um, hope you enjoyed the vid. Gotta be real. The last video I uploaded was about a year ago. And the video was about how to be more productive. So that's super fucking ironic and annoying. <laughs> but I have an excuse. Found out a few months ago that I have fucking crippling ADHD at the age of 25. And the doctors got me on that fucking medicinal good good now so I'm, I think I'll be able to upload more garbage so if you want to see more of my fucking awful garbage content hit that fucking subscribe button and I'll disappoint you less than your stepdad did